the typical imaging experiment works like this. You start with your biological question, you do your experimental planning, and then sample preparation. And those who are image analysts in this room should laugh because they don't typically take part in all of those steps, although they should, right? Um, so when you're bringing stuff to us to analyze, we often get samples that need to be acquired and then analyzed. And very often we're going to tell you at the image analysis step that this is not a biology piece of despair. This is the way how things work. You need to go back to the experimental planning because there are certain flaws in your uh, sample prep that preclude us from being able to answer your biological question. Okay. And this is normal. Raise your hands for the complex experiment that works what worked for you for the first time you've ever tried it. Every single time. Exactly. You have postdocs and graduate students for that, right? They only report positive data. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so this is normal, okay? Uh, this is expected. Those are the most common issues that we are seeing. Poor fixation is number one. Inadequate variable staining out of fluorescence, Brett will have a poster that's for the QBI meeting um, that will talk about how to deal with that in FFP sections. If that poster um, arrives in time, we're going to show it on the wall tomorrow. Um, dirty cover slips, dust, fibers, and bubbles. Um, at the very end of your sample prep, you know, you're tired, you just want to get it done and that bubble ruins your, um, your, your field of view or the dust really, uh, really makes it difficult. Um, and bad choice of mounting media. Just throw away mounting media that contains that. Use it as a separate step. Your life will be better. You're gonna have better relationship with your family. Every, every single thing that can, can go better in life will, I promise. Um, so, <laughs> We here use zinc formalin as our primary fixative, but 10% NBF is okay, and 4% PFA is okay as well. Um, there are certain advantages of all, we don't have time to go into that. Tissue size is very important. In your histological cassette, um, there is no space for anything that's more than three millimeters. So you need to trim it, you cannot squish it. Um, the fixative, the tissue volume ratio needs to be at least 20 to 1. Fixatives are cheap. Your time and your materials are expensive. Don't be cheap, okay? Don't save money by ruining your experiments. Time is very important. At the minimum, it should be 24 hours, um, but the fixation needs to happen as soon as possible after the animal has died or, um, you know, the human have left the... Um, other side of the rainy bridge. Um, up to 72 hours. Um, if you fix for a lot longer, your antigenicity is not going to be there anymore. That's a little bit different for bones. Um, you need to fix them for 72 hours. They're tough to fix, and you change fixative each morning. You fix at room temperature uh, in a container that has a flat bottom. No conical tubes. Um, if you put your tissue in something like this and, and you put a, a little bit of fixative uh, around it, the, the tissue will have greater contact with the plastic than the fixative, okay? Um, the same is gonna happen here. Your tissue can harden, you don't wanna pull it out um, um, through smaller um, opening. Um, something like this works really well. And you wanna fix on a rocker, really, um, important improvement. Um, we here cannot accept samples, for example, fixing buoys because they can leach and damage our sam uh, other samples. And, um, and, and after fixation, you wanna trim your tissues. You wanna make sure that you've got the right part of the tissue that you're gonna submit to your core or that you're gonna process later on. And at that moment in time, you can also check if the tissue is properly fixed inside. If you cut it in half and it's raw inside, not good, not good. As always, you get all of those slides. They're already in that cheat sheet drive, okay? So you don't need to make notes. Um, label your cassettes with pencil or stat mark pen. 
uh, or have them print printed, uh, um, do not use Sharp. They don't survive. All right. You've seen that. You know this. There are many different artifacts that can happen. I'm just flashing them on you. But this is my favorite h &E and you've been working on it. Um, the balance of colors is great. OK. There is a lot more things that are in this presentation. Um, but what I really wanted to do um, is to tell you about how we can deal with variability in the samples and with the problems. Um, and just to, the promised uh, photo of, of my two cats um, uh, is, is shown right here. So this is not our work. Um, I've just found those papers um, very interesting. They come from uh, this group I, I have very big respect for. Um, they definitely know what they're doing. Um, they had a problem that their um, group of samples was very variable, OK? It wasn't done at the same place at the same time and scan with the same scanner. Um, so what they did is they used the estimate stain vectors and they essentially um, used it on different batches of the data to make sure that the vectors and the estimation of what is hematoxin and what is eosin in those batches of slides um, were as truthfully and faithfully as, po as possible representing what's seen on the image. So when we teach people how to do things, we typically tell them, keep everything the same. Okay, and this is very true. It's it's easier to create a sample that's well done than to try to go to this um, to this trouble. But sometimes you have no choice because the sample that you have are very variable. So there are those references that are in this um, PD, uh, this PowerPoint that you have already in your in your Google Drive that will allow you to um, to kind of try. And just a reminder of stain separation how it works, and then there's this manual stain separation that we just trained um, that you can either further refine that process. Um, another example um, where um, they were using different cell detection options for different samples because they couldn't find one that was fitting all. Now, those were bigger cohorts of patients, bigger cohorts of data. Um, you know, it's it's not a one experiment with seven mice in, in them that were done at the same time. This is something much, much more massive. So just a reminder about those different options uh, for cell detection and what they do. Um, and um, we're not going to be spending too much time on it. Another kind of an example or another kind of uh, concept, if something is not quantifiable in the standard way, and you cannot get it to work reliably, and you're not convinced by your results, don't do it. Find a different way, right? If you cannot get the cell count, maybe you can get the area. Um, and this is an example of such a such a um, an approach where sometimes it's very difficult to faithfully detect cells in tissues. Um, and you can, on the other hand, you know, look at individual pixels and classify them to more or less positive. Um, there are lots of problems that go with the DAB images, and that's going to be the first exercise if you want to look at those additional exercises that um, are um, available for you now. Um, just a brief reminder that cell detection generates many measurements, and um, all of those things can actually help you to deal with the data that are a little bit more complex. So now um, we're going to talk and we're going to try um, a random forest, which is a surprisingly robust algorithm. It's that they're actually used all over us in, in many, many, many different aspects of our lives. Um, so now looking at that image and knowing that this is an isotype control, there should be no staining. And this is staining for SARS-CoV-2 in the um, epithelial cells of the lungs and that messy staining um, that's not really true, what would you think would be the features in the object classifier that you could use? 
is the color different? The darkness, is it different? No. Is the pattern different? Nah. A little bit? There are those little granules inside. Okay? And you can actually see it on the screen. I'm sorry, you're hopefully going to be able to see when you open the images on your computer. But this is this is looking more membrane-like, and this is looking pretty granular. It's dull. There is one set of additional features in the software that allow you to see the texture. The answer is here: Harley features um, and smoothed measurements might improve your classification because. Those cells tend to cluster together, right? They're in either along the edge or they're in the central block. So go ahead and open uh, lung SARS-CoV-2 and lung ISO into a new project and see them side by side. Use two panels to see them side by side. Okay, so we're gonna add those two images. I happen to know that they are aged up images. And I can right click, multi view, set grid size to two by one, right click, grid size, two by one. And now I have two viewers. I can open my isotype on the left and my staining on the right. And by default, they start um, and move to this area. So now hopefully it's quite clear what is the true staining, which is right here, and what is the, the non-specific stain. So the right way to do it is to go through all of the previous steps that we've learned, estimate stain vectors, um, you know, spend some time on doing um, the right um, cell um, um, detection, but in the interest of time, and to show you how amazing default settings in Qpath are, we're just going to hit cell detection and just run it. Do the same on this one. We have a pretty decent result to be honest with you. And we're gonna add intensity features. Uh, to do that, I'm gonna select all cells. And it would be good to know what is the pixel size in this image. Uh, it's 1.376, 0 0.136. I want the hematoxin and I want those garlic features. Sorry, the AD as well. Yeah, let's let's take both. The DAD is actually the more important here. It's run. So I've done this on this image. Now I need to do the same on this image. I also need to select the cells. I need to repeat this process. And now if you have 17 images to process, this is the workflow. You open 17 windows and you apply those sequentially and you try not to make a mistake. No, no, that's, that's not the way you do it. You know, and by scripting, which we'll do after coffee break, which is coming soon. Um, 
So now we can, we hopefully have the same workflow on both of those uh, things. And normally I would add some smoother features and massage this a little bit more. But all I would like to do now is um, I'm gonna reset the default classes. Um, I made a mistake. My auto set was on. So all of my cells got automatically uh, or all of my an annotations go automatically annotated. So I'm just gonna go and click none and set uh, class. And I'm going to be very careful to do it on this one. So paying attention to um, what's what's happening. And, and also, like, you know, if you're working on a very different project, um, you may want to start QPAT from scratch. Um, so, so I know that everything that's here is an artifact. So I can add class false, and I can add class true. So I'm only going to annotate the cells that are false positive. I'm going to leave these guys alone. They they did nothing wrong, OK? And I know that cell detection is not ideal, but it's more about concept right now than about um, being super accurate on it. Okay, those are false. Um, those are false as well. These ones right here are true. And it probably will help me to look at the cells that do not have any DAB and annotate them up by other. But I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna start by just by just doing this by just providing. Um, a few examples of my true and my um, and my false cells. I will make sure that they save the data. I'm going to go to this image and I'm going to make sure they save the data. So I'm going to focus my attention on this image right now. And what I will do is I'm going to go to classify, object classification, train object classifier. And we will do what we learned previously within a load train. I have two available images I'm going to add. There is a warning that this specific image is open. That's fine. And I'm going to hit live update. So what I like about this example is that it shows you that there is potential in this classifier, but it still got things wrong, okay? On this image, it kind of looks like it did the right thing. But in this image, we immediately see that we kind of need another class, class of cells that don't have anything. Um, we could also try to limit the features that go into that classifier and only, for example, look for the DAB cells. But um, I'm going to go through the route of um, adding a class of cells that are negative, or maybe I'm going to call them other. Because positive and negative, they're a little special classes. So I think I'm pretty happy with this classifier as it is right now. And in my, um, you know, having a control is amazing, right? Because it allows you to really test your, um, your, your um, image analysis pipeline and see if it's, if it's really doing what it's supposed to do. So now in the isotype control, I have, um, 971 detections and 60 out of them are classified as true. So there's still some space for improvement. But on the other hand, 
on this one, we are getting um, quite a bit more of those true um, uh, detections. And if we were only using standard positive cell detection, for example, or try to set a threshold on that, um, we would get a lot more false positives. I'm going to quickly create a script. Um, and, you know, this is just going to be uh, explained and repeated a little bit more later. So um, this script is um, setting the image type to Brightfield HDAP. Then it's executing a command to do color deconvolution. Then it's doing water shell cell detection. Uh, and it then asks the script through the script Cupid to select the cells, um, run the plugin to create my intensity features, and then apply the classifier. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you on a on an example from the same image but a different region that so far we've looked at a very tiny isolated fragment. And if I will move that over, let's say here, and run. those particular commands on that selected region. And I'm gonna do those, um, those Harley features. Oh, my classifier window is open. That's why it, it started the classification process, but I don't wanna do that because not all of the features are available yet. So I'm going to select my sections. In reality, I selected all of the cells in that image, including the ones that are at the bottom. So just to not add unnecessary measurements to them, I mean, what I'm actually probably gonna do is I'm gonna do this this way. I'm gonna take the selection tool and I'm just gonna select that step. And then I'm gonna run this part of the code, which, do, which will do the hard wow. features. See if I applied them to, yep, got them. And then I can run the classifier. So now in this case, it worked, I would say, decently well. Although, honestly, I'm I'm not hundred percent sure that these cells um, have enough of that membrane staining that I was looking for to call them truly positive. It might be that this is just more of the false positive that's coming from the fact that bronchial cells are often pretty sticky, and I can kind of whoops I can kind of hopefully use this to validate it. Um, See, there is a little bit brown in here, but not as much brown as this. So, you know, maybe I will um, I will accept that result. However, if you would show it a different image that was taken from a different animal or different human, scanned with a different scanner, that model that you've built, where you showed that only those cells that were available in very good likelihood will fail on the other sample set. So those machine learning models, they're only as good as when they look at the sample data that is that has the same characteristics as um, the other sample data that you're going to apply. When you're doing the training, you need to train on the big variability of data that you have. 
to encompass and build the model across all of it. Um, okay, sounds good. So um, hopefully this was convincing enough to um, get you interested in trying this on your own and um, and trying to um, to build that classifier. The next common artifact that we have to deal with is, um, you know, folds in the tissue. So go ahead and open poorly fixed kidney sample. Um, do a cell detection over an area that have a prominent fold. And um, you can, um, for the interest in the interest of time, you can copy the parameters from here. Um, I believe I, not 100% sure actually if I use the default um, stain separation settings or not, um, you can quickly go and do it. And, and I will do it as well. Have some areas that have all kinds of pixels. Stain vectors. Make sure that they are reasonable. They look good. And let's go ahead and let's try to make some detections. The default parameters. this and there are a couple of things that you can see that are quite interesting here you see those blurred areas that's an effect of a bad fixation that sample didn't want to stick to the glass at all so it lifted during the staining process and when slide scanner scans an image it scans something that's that looks like a dome, and that dome makes it impossible to focus on it. There are ways to go around it, but the, the best is to start with a well-made sample. Um, and when you have a, a really bad fold, um, you know there are going to be some cells that are on the top, some cells that are on, on, on the bottom, and it's going to look like that. Um, interestingly, um, some of those nuclei, although you kind of see only the shadow of them, right, they can still be detected. And that's partly because um, there is some smoothing that goes into the uh, cell detection um, so that image is actually not that, that terrible um, for, for a pupa. But if you want to make some kind of measurement on that, that's probably not going to be a very accurate measurement. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things that we could do to at least get rid of that very nasty fold, which does not provide it with much useful information, is to change the max background intensity and lower it. Let's try to see how it's gonna uh, deal with uh, max background intensity of one, not much change, 0 0.5. Looking quite a bit better, 0 0.25. And we largely eliminated that fault. Um, my general rule of thumb is that if you're looking at an artifact, that's not a true and faithful representation of the underlying biology. So if I would make a choice, I would make a choice not to quantify those cells, not to base my, my assumptions on something I know is technically wrong. How many of you got to this point? That's definitely enough. Um, so just to recap, um, when dealing with faults, um, when you are um, doing your cell detection, you can adjust this max background intensity parameter, and um, that's going to take care of things that are um, uh, 
um, that are uh, out of uh, that are folded. Uh, I find that I have a lot more difficulty dealing with areas that are out of focus. Um, maybe someone from the audience has some ideas of how to deal with them. Ah, here we go. Uh... Come, come over here so the people on Zoom can can hear you. I guess well, one of the things I would look for is whether or not I can use one of the Harlick features to detect the cells that have a kind of smooth texture and then eliminate them based on a positive or negative classifier. There's this thing called super pixels. Uh, this, um, this was part of QPath before the pixel classifier was really built and efficient and, and working. Um, and so he built it as like a pseudo pixel classifier kind of. And I am in love with this feature. It is amazing. I use it pretty frequently. He wants to get rid of it. I won't let him. I keep just talking about how amazing this feature is. <laughs> um, sorry, I get excited. <laughs> um, is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I was going to, like I said, I was, I was going to lead you through this, but uh, we're going to do this real fast. Um, okay. So under files and superpixels, there's these things called SLIC superpixels. Um, superpixels are kind of like if you took the wand tool and just like pointed it at lots of different things. It's um, it's ways of grouping the pixels that are respecting the natural boundaries of the tissue um, of of whatever it is you're looking at, um, uh, but they're not like really pixel by pixel -like perfect objects. Um, and so I believe for this one, what I was doing was this. Um, okay, so real quick, um, super pixel spacing is um, it'll basically put one tile every approximately 20 microns. It's not exact. Um, uh, before doing it, it applies a Gaussian sigma of two um, to just kind of smooth out the nuclei. I'm not trying to be that level of detail. Um, regularization is um, how square the super pixels are going to look. If you set that to one, you will get, I believe, square or, or incredibly close to like perfect cornered super pixels. Um, so something like this, there's just not a lot of contrast here at all. So it just leaves them square. Um, but as you, uh, get to some, something interesting in the tissue, do you see how like this little blip is a little bit darker than its neighbors? And so it put a boundary in the intensity gradient. Um, here's a good one, like at the edge of the fold, it, it like put boundaries here. Um, and auto adapt, what it does is it, like where there's contrast to be had, it uses um, a lot of weird shapes where there's just nothing, it just leaves things square. Um, and so what I, what I really like about this is it does actually, it gets boundaries at a pretty high resolution, but then allows you to step back and do the classification at low resolution. Um, and so I, I end up using it at times where, um, if you were to zoom in on just a couple pixels, you couldn't tell what type of cell you were looking at. Um, like any any dark cell, like if you were just zoom in really hard, you can't tell if this is a fold or if this is just a densely stained region because some of them are just dark. Um, to, to really tell what's going on, you need to look at more context. Um, but I don't just want to use a low resolution pixel classifier and deal with the, like the blockiness of that. Um, so, I'm going to add a couple of classes called fold, called part of focus, and called good. Um, oh, one thing, uh, super pixels don't by default come with measurements. So we're going to all detections. Yep. Features, add intensity features. This, this. I'm going to do this. Uh, 
two, um, then auto set. Here's some folds. Clean up that edge. Got it. Oh, I'm hitting. I'm hitting Alt and not action. Fold, 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 fold. Out of focus, it's like this thing, this thing, and this thing. And here, and here. And good tissue is like this. Stars, but there are some stars. Yeah. Not like this, not like this. Uh, and you can, if you really want to get fancy, you can do, uh, yeah, I'm going to ignore all of that because um, that's just white space. Uh, good. Oh, it's a lot of white space. Good. Good. Okay. Classify. Object classifier. Train. Live. Using areas this one instead of one because. Because um, since the since these are in an object classifier, I'm I'm using the areas as Mike said. I don't know if I can hear you. Um, because when I grab, if I if I were to let me grab like this entire area, even though I've highlighted a fairly large area, all it grabbed is one super pixel with one set of features. So it's like one data point. Um, so you're not you're not really at risk of grabbing too much of that at once. Mm -hmm. Unless you were to like say all of this background all at once, one big giant thing, and which is exactly what I did. And it was a mm -hmm. mistake. But in fact, I'm going to delete that because it's wrong. Don't do things like what I just did. Okay. Uh, focus. Focus. I'm. That looks. Okay. Um, if I had like 20 minutes, yeah, if I had like four minutes, I could get this pretty nice. Um, if you look real hard on YouTube, you can find videos of me doing this. Um, uh, but so the overall impression you get is like, where is it bubbly? Where is it folded over? And where is it actually good? And then you can count how many super pixels are each and decide. Um, this tissue is 80% good quality, compare different fixative types, um, fixation profiles, and figure out which one is quantitatively the best. Tying this back into the cell detection, you can also convert these into annotations with one of the yeah. other options in that tool, and then run the cell detection just within the good areas. Yeah. Yes, yes. So one of the things is... Um, you can you can also make more detections and just get rid of the bad ones. Yes. Okay. Um, and um, this was very good, Sarah. Thank you. So we are going to um, go to our last image they wanted to show you, which is um, dealing with edge artifacts. It's a one to the last. Uh, and this one is um, based on the image called liver immune. So go ahead and drop it into into the into QPath. It's a fluorescence image. Let's go ahead and adjust our display settings. I like have my camera to one. I like to work with my individual channels, observe what's going on. Uh, this is supposed to be T cell stain, but we have a lot of out of fluorescence and other problems in this tissue. So it's that's a T cell right here, but there, there, there are a bunch of erythrocytes, and there are other artifacts that are very prominently visible in this, including some regions that are out of focus. They're not related to the sample quality itself, but to the fact that the slide was tilted in the scanner. 
and uh, in my presentation I have a little illustration of how it works but essentially you're trying to take a picture and that picture is going across your slide like this right one edge of the slide and you can barely see it on the screen i'm very sorry um but but one edge of the slide um the, the line kind of goes right here um they're they're like watch the watch the presentations kind of here sorry uh that projector doesn't really do um a good job on, on, on showing this um and we have some ida1 uh, staining in the green and um you see that the border of the tissue is a lot brighter than the rest. And then finally, we have um, staining for Li6G. Like this is supposed to be neutrophil marker. And in this particular tissue section, um, we see that there are a bunch of nuclei that are large. Those nuclei belong to hepatocytes. You can see it by the pattern. Um, they are not um, neutrophils at all. And um, that's a neutrophil. And that's a neutrophil, and that's a neutrophil. But when you move um, deeper into the tissue, you can also find some cells that are neutrophils, um, but now their overall intensity is much thinner. So if you try to find a single, um, single uh, threshold to classify them as positive or negative for that marker, you may have some difficulties out of the tools that you've seen today and tried, what tool you would use to um, to deal with that problem, to teach the software what is true and what's wrong. I've, I've, I've heard a rumor that someone thinks it might be a classifier. That's one way to do that. The other way to do that is to incorporate um, the information about the background around these cells because that background here is greater than the background over here. And that is something that uh, we will post on the forum um, at some point in time um, when we all recover from this uh, awesome event. And, uh, and uh, it essentially uses some of the tools that Sarah mentioned, which is uh, looking at the, the information around through the cell detection and the, the circle ROI around each cell to add additional measurements to QPath. There is a little bit of scripting involved, but we're just heading into that section. So um, um, you're gonna be you're you're gonna be um, well informed about the script editor and about what it can do. Um, the last um, kind of presentation that I wanted to show you is uh, oh and, and not all antibodies create similar problems. So sometimes by switching the antibody to a different clone, uh, you can get rid of a, a lot of the uh, of the issue. Um, the other thing is there was a question about detecting cells without nuclei. And you can actually use other detection sources. So in this case, um, and this is one of the images we have available, this is uh, immune column. <coughs> There are there's standing for CD8, CD4, and CD103. CD4 is expressing more many more cells. There's also macrophages express CD4 because they're annoying uh, and beautiful. And um, on the other hand, CD8 cells have this more stereotypical way of um, of being um, uh, more spread in the tissue. Um, CD103 cells similarly, and they're a little bit more spread. So if your cells are far apart and they're not clustered together too much, um, you can essentially just use CD8 instead of hex or DNA as your detection image. And the same for CD103 and CD4. And I'm just presenting to you what are the results of using uh, pretty much default detection settings, um, just changing that um, detection image. Um, so in this case, just to give you a quick example, Power to create a small annotation. And use this detection channel. Maybe increase the threshold a little bit. And now I I because I don't have nuclei. Cell expansion is not as informative, right? 
um, because that's really the membrane or close to the membrane. Um, so I switched to seeing only the nuclei and I definitely need to increase my threshold because I'm picking up a lot of noise. And there's still some work to do here, but you can see that this tool can actually be used to detect at least something that looks like it's a positive cell in this image. Now, this image has a lot of artifacts and you're not gonna have an easy time doing something like this on an image that looks like that. It needs to be a much better quality image. If your cells are very bunched together, um, that's gonna be a bigger problem and that's a topic of tomorrow's discussion of cell phones.